Inflation is a function of the market losing faith in a currency's purchasing power. And that is going to happen once the market realizes that central banks have no ability to ever remove their accommodative monetary policy. While some online bullion dealers continue to charge almost $2 over spot for one ounce silver rounds, SD Bullion is selling one ounce silver rounds at only 49 cents over spot on any quantity. Again, that's 999 fine silver for just 49 cents over spot for any quantity. If you haven't joined the over 40,000 precious metals investors by making the switch to SD Bullion, what are you waiting for? You could save hundreds or even thousands of dollars on your next order. SD Bullion, the lowest prices, period. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with financeandliberty.com and back with us today is Michael Pento from Pento Portfolio Strategies. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me back on, Elijah. All right, well, you recently wrote an article titled Trump will fire Yellen or vice versa. And you talk about how the economy is grinding towards a recession, but the Fed is really ignoring this. And maybe it's not that the Fed is stupid. Maybe it's not that Janet Yellen doesn't understand that the economy is grinding towards a recession. You're saying that it doesn't make sense right now that they're raising interest rates. This doesn't make any sense given that the economy is grinding towards a halt. But you're saying that maybe... Janet Yellen is doing this on purpose and it's strategic in your belief. What is your perspective on this? Well, it just struck me as very odd that under the entire tenure of Barack Obama, a Democrat, that Janet Yellen, a liberal Democrat and Keynesian, only found it necessary to raise interest rates one time outside of the December rate hike after Trump was elected. Of after the November 8th election. So I found it very odd that this person, this individual, found a myriad of excuse, excuses, mostly uh, the fact that she was data dependent and the data did not lend itself for her to raise interest rates more than one time during that entire eight-year stretch. And then all of a sudden, in uh, De uh, December 2016 and through today, which is in July of 2017, the Fed has raised rates a total of four times and has now threatened to start unwinding in September the announcement of the unwinding of a portion, a great portion of its four and a half trillion dollar asset base. So they'll be selling, um, in my estimation, beginning in October to December timeframe this year, start unwinding two trillion dollars worth of mortgage-backed securities and treasuries, a combination of those two assets. So I had to ask myself why all of a sudden, given the fact that the economic data has actually slowed. So we were growing around 2% throughout the Obama administration since 2010 through, through uh, 2016, to the end of 2015. 2016, we grew 1.6%. And Q1 2017 was 1.4 percent GDP growth, and not only that, inflation. If you look at core measures of inflation, and most specifically the core PCE, which is the Fed's preferred inflation metric, they're falling downward. They're falling away, further away from the Fed's two percent inflation target. So if we have growth that's slow and slowing, and inflation that's falling further away from the 2% target, why is Janet Yellen suddenly uh, found her monetary manhood, so to speak? And, and my conclusion was that if Janet Yellen loves her job as, as Fed chair, um, and it's, uh, her, her tenure expires in February of 2018, perhaps she would like to send the economy into a recession, Trump would get the blame for it. And if Trump gets fired before she gets fired in uh, it's sort of like a tongue in cheek analysis, but perhaps if Trump gets uh, fired before she gets fired, then she can maintain her position. So what would Trump being fired mean to you? Uh, well, I mean, we have, we have President 
Mike Pence is what it would mean to me. But um, the, the problem I have is that trying to analyze Donald Trump is a trenchant gap between uh, candidate Trump and President Trump. So I'm not quite sure uh, what the difference between uh, Mike Pence and Donald Trump would actually be. So during Trump's candidacy, candidacy he wanted a strong dollar. He wanted r- rising interest rates. And he said the stock market was in a a very, very big bubble. And now President Trump is very much convinced that the stock market is emblematic of his successes and that Janet Yellen's not such a bad uh, chairman, chairwoman, might be re, re, uh, renominated in, um, reappointed in December, in uh, actually February 2018. And, uh, you know, like the dollar is, uh, is something that needs to be weak, not strong. So uh, actually, if Trump were to leave, we probably would probably get uh, uh, Mike Pence, obviously, and we might get uh, Mr. Cohen as head of the Federal Reserve. And uh, we would still have, in my opinion, a very low nominal Fed funds rate. So how do you see this happening? I mean, would, you're saying that Trump would be impeached then? Uh, you, you, I think you, you're um, over analyzing my analysis. My analysis, as I said, was tongue in cheek. In other words, uh, what my, the, the nucleus of my analysis was, I was wondering why Janet Yellen suddenly and other members of the FOMC were suddenly in a panic to raise interest rates and to unwind its balance sheet when the economy and inflation data were actually pointing towards the reverse of that. So I said the only conclusion is she wants to hurt Donald Trump and, and maybe to save her own job. But I mean, in reality, who, who knows what, why she's doing what she's doing? You know, you have to also look what's going on in the rest of the world. The ECB and the Bank of England, they are also thinking about raising rates and stopping QE. That's the same in the Bank of Canada. And even I'm hearing in the Bank of Japan now, there's rumors that Abenomics is is failing and that the Japanese citizenry wants to remove that policy. So, you know, there's a lot of groupthink in global central banks. Uh, perhaps Janet Yellen isn't trying to. I mean, if you want to get to the, the, to the truth, Janet Yellen was probably, in my opinion, trying to get a Democrat elected. And when Hillary Clinton didn't get uh, get elected, she felt it was free to start normalizing policy. So that's my best guess. But if Donald Trump was to be impeached, um, that wouldn't necessarily save Janet Yellen's job, let's be honest. Now, you've talked about the inflation rate, and you're saying that it's actually below the Fed's target. You've been writing recently that basically the Fed will have to reverse, and that some people are wanting to put the target inflation rate above 2%. Can you expand on this? Well, it's my ardent belief that the central banks were the primary drivers of the reflation trade. In other words, the economy never really recovered from the Great Recession. And I spoke about that just prior to this question, that we never really got above 2%. We never grew it anywhere close to 3%, which is really the normal coming out of a recovery. And even stronger than that. And now we have a 1% handle throughout the world, Japan and Europe and the United States. All the major economies are growing with a 1% handle. And uh, I, 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 for, I firmly believe that now that central banks are unwinding their stimuli, that we are going to have a collapse in asset prices. And I'll say that the record high real estate prices extend today will not last. The bond bubble will, will pop as a function of what central banks are doing and uh, and stock prices, which are at all time record high and have record low cash levels in institutions and real estate and and, uh, and uh, individual in institutions and individuals accounts and a record high level of margin debt and total market cap to GDP is one hundred and thirty five percent. That's unprecedented, really outside of a small window in 2000. So these bubbles are going to pop, and that's going to send the anemic growth rate of the economy from a 1% handle to a a less than 0% growth rate. And that's going to send central banks into a panic mode 
And they just can't cut interest rates because, for, like, for instance, the ECB, interest rates are at zero. And in Japan, interest rates are at zero. And in the Federal Reserve's instance, interest rates are at 1%. One, 1%. So cutting interest rates are not a viable option. And simply going to QE isn't really a, a viable option either because the economy – based the, the economic growth, whatever economic growth that we have, anemic as it is – is predicated on asset bubbles and this wealth effect. So when that goes away, we're going to have cascading GDP growth. And just starting to go back into QE isn't going to be good enough. I think they're going to have to get to 2% inflation. That's their target. They're going to have to get there very quickly. And the only way to do that isn't quantitative easing in the traditional sense, if you could say traditional, because it's really a new uh, paradigm that was – invented with Ben Bernanke in 2008, they're going to have to deploy something known as helicopter money, which is an end run around the banking system. So they're going to have to print money and directly send it to the citizens of the United States. That's what I'm predicting. Um, and I think it's going to happen rather quickly after the next recession becomes manifest. Now, I know the last time we had you on, you were predicting that in December, of this year, we'd see a stock market crash. Can you give us an update on this? Well, you know, one, one always gets in trouble when they give you a, a market call and a date. So uh, so I will tell you this. Uh, I, am, I am not God. There is only one God, and it certainly isn't me. But I will tell you this, that if you believe my predicate that asset bubbles and the wealth effect have floated asset prices much higher than can be supported by underlying fundamental, fundamental growth, then you would say that the reverse of this easing from central banks would cause these asset prices to correct and send the economy into a recession. So I, I believe in September, on September 7th, you're going to get a decision from the ECB, European Central Bank. Mario Draghi is supposed to lay out uh, his schedule for, for tapering his quantitative easing program. And if that's the case, in conjunction with the Federal Reserve on September 20th, announcing their schedule for quantitative tightening or what I call reverse QE, where they're going to outline their exact start date for when they're going to unwind or allow their balance sheet to shrink. That could be enough to slowly and surely send long-term borrowing costs higher. And I'm not even too sure, Elijah, that it's going to be slowly. I'm, I'm pretty confident of the surely, but it could be a violent spike in bond yields, especially in Europe, where you have the German 10-year boomed at 55 basis points, and yet you have growth much higher. We have growth double that, actually uh, triple, uh, triple that. So growth is around 1.5%, almost 2%. In Germany, and inflation at two percent. So you're talking about nominal growth in Germany, approaching four percent, and a ten-year note at 0.55. Uh, that means that that yield, and there's a very close correlation historically between the ten-year note and nominal GDP. So there's a good chance that that rate can go from 55 basis points right up to two percent very quickly. And in that scenario. Uh, you'll have that'll drag up rates across the globe in violent in a violent reaction, and I, I don't think it's possible the stock market could ignore that. All right, and before we let you go, I was wanting to get your perspective on the future of Social Security, Medicare, and pension plans. You recently wrote about this and how you were talking about the Illinois debt problem right now and how pension plans over there could be really in trouble. Did you want to give us? your perspective on when we see this coming collapse, you know, the stock market collapse and um, the collapse of the monetary system, what your perspective is about what will happen to Social Security, Medicare, and pension plans? Well, as you pointed out, Illinois has unfunded liabilities about around $250 billion. It's 25% of its budget. Um, you look at uh, Ohio has uh, liability six times over its its uh, revenues. Um Total U.S. debt is 350% of GDP. Uh, that normal debt-to-GDP ratio is 150%. Um, 
If you look at global debt, is is uh, the global debt to GDP ratio three hundred and thirty percent, two hundred and thirty trillion dollars? That's up sixty five to seventy trillion since two thousand and eight. So, uh, so interest rates can never be allowed to normalize by central banks. That's that's their big mistake. That's their folly and their hubris. They believe that they solved the great financial crisis of two thousand and eight that their problems are in the rearview mirror, and now it's time to normalize interest rates. But when interest rates normalize, for instance, in the United States, if interest rates were just to return to normal levels, the average interest rate paid on our debt, we'd be paying an extra trillion dollars per annum added to the deficit just on interest payments. So, you know, if you look at it, we only have revenue of three and a half trillion. So, uh, you know, add an additional one trillion dollars to deficits, which will already be a trillion dollars, and that trillion dollar increase is going to cause, most likely, cause a recession, which is going to add another trillion dollars to the deficit. I mean, you're very close to having a um, uh, multi-trillion dollar annual deficits. So interest rates can never be allowed to normalize. And imagine what that recession would do. I just quoted the. The outstanding liabilities, um, the unfunded liability for Medicare is just under $50 trillion. Social Security is $25 trillion. You, you get to understand how a recession, which just cuts the legs off of revenue, can never be allowed to happen in order for these insolvent programs to even look like they're solvent. So we're in a big, big watershed dramatic change is ahead in our future where the, the, the market's going to understand that central banks can never normalize interest rates. And that's when I think fiat currencies come under a lot of pressure. And that's when inflation becomes unhinged. Remember, inflation is not a function of people being prosperous. Inflation is a function of the market losing faith in a currency's purchasing power. And that is going to happen once the market realizes that central banks have no ability to ever remove their accommodative monetary policy. So it's going to happen on a global basis. It's going to happen in the United States, China, Japan, Europe. And look at the case in Japan at 200, uh, 250% debt to GDP, uh, and they have a 0% 10-year yield, 10-year note yield, and a 2% inflation target. So, I mean, how is that ever going to be tenable? It's not possible. So that's the big that's the big watershed event, and it means a lot for your investments too. You have to be able to monitor this dynamic and be able to profit from it. All right. Well, Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers where they can find you and any last thoughts you had? Well, my website is pentoport.com, and my email address is mpento at pentoport.com. And the number here at the office is 732-772-9500. And if you're interested in uh, not just owning a basket of gold stocks and shorting the market always. If you're interested in getting the timing right or having a chance to profit from all dynamics, deflationary collapses of the economy and times of hyperinflation, this is the place you need to be. Once again, Michael Pento from Pento Portfolio Strategies. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me back on, Elijah.